Hi, I'm Wet Kusing. Uh, I work at Central Ohio Technical College, and I'm going to kind of give you an overview of the, <coughs> the bridge competition for MFS Knox. Uh, let's see, is this one going to stand up? I won't have to stand here and dock so bad. So civil engineering, this, this exercise kind of focuses on civil, and that's the branch of engineering that specializes in the design and constructions, construction of structures such as bridges, roads and dams. So architects focus on buildings that people go into. This focuses on kind of structures and civil works, public works frequently. While doing their work, civil engineers must keep an eye on the cost of the project as well as how the project affects the environment, safety, and government regulations. All of those are important. There's a lot to be learned from failure. Sometimes we learn as much from how things fail as we do from how things stand up and work. So obviously there's some failure there. And bridges are one of the things we've learned about in some failures. There's been a lot of lessons over the years in how bridges have failed. And then why we build a bridge? Why do you think we build a bridge? To get to the other side. That's kind of like the chicken thing. Why <laughs> the chicken cross the road, right? To get to the other side. So the other answers could be cross over a natural or man-made obstacle. So you've got to get over there somehow, it could be water, it could be a valley, valley, it could be whatever. Stream or river, or other, think of highways, they're bridges over other roads, and sometimes they're bridges over bridges, and all kinds of uh, arrangements of the transportation system. A valley, there's uh, one, a neat example way back in the presentation of one through a valley. Railroads, think of bridges over railroads. And lots of people are involved in the development of bridges. There's lots of careers that relate to the putting together of bridges. All these different things could be uh, employed somewhere in that project. Okay, so some terms that are going to be critical for you to know, and they're going to help you with this project. Number one is span. That's the distance between two bridge supports. So if, if I had a bridge across these two tables, this would be the span. It's not how long the bridge is, it's how long. Generally, span in a structural sense is considered where, where kind of the thing dumps its load out or where it rests or bears. So the bridge would be here to here, that would be its span. So that, on your little picture here, these two lines represent span. So nothing can touch in there. This area in here is like this area in here. If you put part of your bridge in there, it's gonna fall into whatever the bridge is supposed to be across. So that's critical. It's critical that you understand span. Compression, <coughs> a force that acts to compress or shorten the thing it's acting on. So if you try to mash your hands together as you push them together, that's compression. That's important. As you build your bridge, all of the toothpicks will be pretty much in tension or compression. So they'll be trying to mash the toothpick or tension. That's a force that acts to expand or lengthen the thing it's acting on. So that'd be trying to pull the toothpick or the joints apart. Scour is kind of a bridge term. That's the force of water in a stream act acting on the bridge. So that's a force of the water kind of tumbling under it or through its piers that tends to want to take that material away. That's called scour. Wind load, bridges also get forces of the wind. Uh, later we'll see some examples of where the wind itself has destroyed a bridge. Uh, it was just down in uh, Wheeling where it, they had one of the first early suspension bridges in Ohio and it only lasted a few years because the wind grabbed it and flipped it upside down way back. So wind load is important. And then resonance, that relates to that. That's a vibration in something caused by an external force like wind. So wind can take a swinging bridge and it can swing it too violently due to that resonance and tear it apart. And then if you've ever heard of people um, always walking, across, military forces always walking across a bridge, not marching, that's so it doesn't get that resonance and damage the bridge or take it out. Torsion, that's a force that acts to turn or twist the thing it's acting on. So a bridge in the wind may have torsion in that twisting force. So history of bridge construction. Bridges go back a long time in our human history. <coughs> so that might, who knows, maybe the first bridges were something like that, hard to tell. Or more likely. 
exactly, something like that. Have you ever done that in the woods where you see a bridge, or a, a bridge, it is a bridge, but a tree across the stream, or a little ravine or something, and you can scamper across the, the log. That was probably the, the concept for the first bridges, that you could lay logs across something that you need to get across. And then some pretty important early bridges, like Pont du Gard, that the Romans built, utilizing arches. So we'll talk about different way bridges were made here in a bit, but uh, bridges that are made, early bridges, were typically arch structures. And this is the first bridge that was made of metal or, or wrought iron, cast iron. So an innovation there to make a lasting bridge in England. That bridge still there? It is still there. Yeah, first bridge, still standing. No traffic, you can walk across it. Beautiful little bridge. But no track, no uh, vehicular traffic at this, at this time. Uh, steel and concrete bridges. So most of our bridges today fall into the categories. Most of what we build are steel and concrete, so they're pretty modern materials. Is there any steel in a concrete bridge? Yes, there's a bullet steel in there. So concrete's real good at that compressive force it has very little tensile force to it. So the steel's in there for the pulling. Steel's real good at tensile forces, really bad. Or steel's good at both tension and compression, but concrete will only do the compression part. So some types of bridges and material arches. We saw some of those, one of the earliest techniques. They can be made of stone or concrete. So you're building a toothpick bridge, so that won't apply to that much, but you could use arches for it. Trusses can be iron, wood, or steel. Trusses are a good example of what to look to for a toothpick bridge. Uh, beam, steel, or concrete. Some of you may attempt some beam bridges. Uh, suspension or steel cable, probably not a good application for a toothpick bridge. And cable <coughs> scaled, cable stayed uh, with cable, precast concrete, various materials for that. We'll look at some of these and see what they're like. So the arch bridge, that's the oldest types. Arches direct loads to piers or abutments. An arch bridge pretty much works all in compression. That's the, the strength of that kind of construction. Uh, the arches direct loads to piers or abutment. Great natural strength spans between 200 to 1,000 feet. So not a huge spanning ability. And that's the way they work by material that tends to be in compression and then arch, arches over the, the, the span. Here's some examples of some early arch bridges. And that's an arch, br arch bridge, but a more modern example. I think it may have some concrete and steel involved. Beam bridges, uh, lots of these around, pretty simple to build. Loads carried vertically through piers to the ground, probably the least expensive. Uh, rarely span more than 200 feet, so they're not huge spanning objects. And they literally work like a beam, so the which we put a beam across the two cables, that's kind of the force they would make. And that'd be an example of a lot of our modern highway bridges or beam bridges. Truss bridge. Now this is probably the best application of your toothpick bridge. Toothpick bridges don't really want to be a beam because you're not allowed to glue toothpicks side to side, and that would tend to build a beam if you start to do side to side gluing. So in this exercise, you're not allowed to glue toothpicks side to side, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, so made of a combination of triangles, so perfect application of toothpicks, because you can make lots of triangles. Directs loads from a diagonal framework to the piers, more rigid than a single beam, used for longer bridges and combined with other types of bridges. And you can see there the span lengths get pretty big, 120 to 750 feet. So that would be an example of a truss bridge. As I drove into town, I saw some great examples of truss bridges. <coughs> Can any of you think of where there's a good example of one? Did you drive into town? Which way did you come? Right there on South Main. Yeah, the one that's just been turned into a pedestrian bicycle bridge. Great yep. example of a truss bridge. I think I saw another one down. There's several right here down the road. So if you look to the railroad bridges, they were really good at building efficient truss bridges. Really good example. So there's one. Railroads use lots of truss bridges. So there you get the X's. You can reproduce that in toothpicks, and you'd have a pretty successful bridge. This would be another one. This one's down, down towards Newark, outside of Newark. And there you can see the triangulation and the trusses that um, do the bridge <coughs> to the bottom of the bridge deck here. If you look, they've even crossed. 
cross braids at the bottom of the bridge deck. You may want to think about that a little bit. Suspension bridge is a little too complicated to be made out of toothpicks, but I uh, wouldn't say never. Uh, suspend the road, suspends the roadways from main cables. Main cables are supported by high towers and secured by anchorages, most expensive. But as you can see, our span goes way up, 1,000 to 700, 7,000 feet. So you're familiar with seeing these. There's not a ton of them around. Like I said, if you go to Wheeling, there's one. If you go to Cincinnati, there's some great examples of some early ones in Wheeling. And then the famous Golden Gate Bridge. But the bridge is really slung from those cables. So this is acting quite a bit in tension. This is mainly a tension bridge. And then the bridge deck is hung from that tensile force. And so there'd be an example of one. You'd see the cables carried and all these little wires come down and carry the, help carry the bridge deck across that distance. And if you look, the bridge deck is working like a truck, so it's really hanging a truss. So that's all cross, cross brace as a truss at the bottom. Cabled stay bridge is a little different. Uh, it's not quite hanging the roadway. The, hang, the roadway hangs really from central pier, if you want to see some of that. So towers support the bridge deck directly. Cables run from deck to the tower. Towers direct the load vertically into the ground. Spans of 2,500 to 7,500 feet. These can be pretty elegant structures also. So the kind of they harp out and carry the, the road roadway um, directly to these piers. So that would be a good example. And that's a bridge over a valley. This is a Moulier Bridge in France. So it just crosses the whole valley area. <coughs> you can see it's kind of harped and all of the cables come back and carry the bridge. All right, so I said we we're going to learn a little bit from failure. Here's a, a famous failure. And this is, they called it Galloping Gertie because in the wind it twisted and it lasted a few years this way and eventually the, the, a wind caught it at the right speed. Uh, and that's kind of a harmonic loading too. The more it twisted, the more it caught the wind perfectly and it made it dance. And finally it danced its final dance and it fell down. Uh, there's some neat videos of it. If you go online, you can see videos of it failing and falling. So the Tent Tacoma Narrows Bridge, Tacoma, Washington over Puget Sound. It was a suspension bridge, mode of failure was wind load, it failed in 1940. Uh, so it failed November, it only, yeah, it didn't last very long at all. So it really, not a what, what was the name of that one? Uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Mm -hmm. And they literally were videoing it as it failed. It's kind of cool to, well, it's disturbing to see, but it's You can cool. type in Galloping Gertie, too. It will come up on. Yeah, it's pretty amazing the abuse it took before it finally came apart. Uh, so they learned that, and, and part of the bridge was pretty narrow and delicately built, you know, strong enough for what it was supposed to do, but the wind just made it twist too much, and then it broke the material, so it finally failed. Silver Bridge, a famous failure in Gallipolis, Ohio. Uh, it was an I-bar suspension bridge, so kind of a suspension slash hybrid truss there. Mode of failure, I think there was some kind of bolt failure or some connection mm -hmm. failure that took it down. Um, it was an eye bolt and the pin in the eye bolt. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. I, it was I listened very carefully when Brian presented about it. Fairly simple thing <laughs> that brought down a very large bridge. Uh, kind of a, I, I remember when this happened as a kid. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of a kid. And uh, it yeah. was bad because it was Christmas time. Everybody's Christmas shopping mm -hmm. and it was full of busy shoppers and people coming back from Christmas. Yeah, uh, the eye bolt and the pin. Um, the pin actually rusted out within the eye oh, bolt. Was it rust? And you couldn't, they couldn't see the failure that was occurring with, within because of how it was enclosed. And Minneapolis, this was all in more within your time uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was location in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was a deck truss, mode of failure was material failure there also. Date of failure, August of 2007. And there's a video of it going down. That was a busy highway that fell into the tide of the Mississippi River. Another disastrous failure. It took, and both of those took quite a few lives. Galloping Gertie, I think everybody got off. It was kind of too wild to get traffic on it. So not a good, not a good failure. So it's important to use good structural sense in building a bridge. So this had. Uh, fracture, critical inspections, make sure that they're inspecting the bridge to look for things that are going to make it fail in better design. So 
There's just some cool bridges. There's that newer one in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, kind of a kind of a arch bridge, but using it kind of tension and then reverse. And uh, I don't know what that one's a Bering Straits bridge. I'm not sure it ever got built. Sounds like a dream idea. And there's these around old-fashioned covered bridges. Frequently underneath their skin is a great uh, truss bridge that they're all cross braced wood. You can see some good examples to think about for toothpick bridges under the skin of these. Uh, here's a famous one. That's the Orsund Bridge. Huge, long, hang out through the water. The piers and kind of a beam bridge, it looks like. And that'd be kind of an arch with cables coming down and holding a bridge. And another fancy one. That's a cable stayed through the piers and the cables coming out to carry the deck. Another one of that type, U.S. Grant Bridge in Portsmouth. And this other one we looked at before in Lincoln County. So once again, you can see it's triangulated, a truss bridge. And another kind of ocean example. And we've got Milo Bridge that's really cool. It goes across that valley. Uh, I forget how many miles, but almost <coughs> a thousand feet above the valley. Um, but it's really, it goes on for, seems like, a mile or so, several miles. Famous Sydney Harbor Bridge, there's kind of a arch bridge, but it's using trusses and pencil structure also. And there's a weird one, how about a bridge for boats? Those, the old canal around here used to have these uh, to take, take boats over other rivers. So the challenge, your challenge is to design, so your toothpick bridge is designed the most efficient, economical, and aesthetic bridge using only toothpicks and glue. So you gotta use the wooden toothpicks you're given, right? Mm -hmm. And the glue you are given. The uh, structural efficiency is equal to the weight supported divided by the weight of the bridge. So the idea is you want the bridge to carry as many times its own weight as possible. Uh, the aesthetics of the bridge will be determined through visual appeal, uniqueness, neatness, and symmetry. So try not to have a bunch of messy gluing and have it kind of tidy. That'll get you points for kind of beauty points on it. And then you'll also be judged on cost effectiveness based on how many toothpicks and how much glue you use. Uh, the bridge must have a minimum clear span of 12 inches in length and rest on the abutments either side of the river. The abutments are to be part of the bridge. So you're going to build the height of the bridge. There's, it's not like these two tables where you're going to have the gap. It's really like sitting on the table. So your bridge is going to sit here on the table. You're going to build the height to get a 2 inch by 12 inch piece of stuff kind of under it. So it's got to come up 2 inches and have a clear space under the bridge of 2 inches. And then not touch in the middle of this piece of paper, only can touch to the edge of the piece of paper. So this little diagram shows you that two inch by 12 inch boat clearance under the bridge. So that's the thing you gotta remember, you gotta build the bridge up that two inches so that things can get under it. Uh, this is an actual <coughs> picture, picture of the bridge masher. So your bridge is gonna sit here to here. This is water, nothing in the bridge can touch the water. The hole is where the weights will go down through your bridge. But the red line is the 12 inches where that's represented. Here, same thing. So here's this edge is here, <coughs> here. So you need an area 12 inches by 2 inches under there that a boat could go through anywhere under the bridge. A 2 inch high boat could go through anywhere. Edge to edge, 12 inches. So your bridge is going to come on out here. Uh, forget what you're allowed to go. Uh, no, it's just maximum length, I think, maybe. But 12 inches is that critical span. And then it's gonna have a little block of wood on it uh, that needs to go down through the bridge. So you have the bridge structure, this little block of wood has to go down through it and then that'll get attached <coughs> with a cable and that's the weight that'll pull down and mm -hmm. smash your bridge. And that's that diagram that's in the paper here. You've gotta maintain this two inches all the way across. So clear to the edge of the river, both sides, 12 inches. Two inches, so a 12 by 2 inch area. So you've got to have this imaginary space, 2 inches high and 12 inches long that sits in here, and your bridge can't be in any of that space. That's the bare minimum. It can't be more. It can't be more.
more. It right? can be more, yeah. yeah. <coughs> more, but can't but can't be less than that. And is, uh, there, is there a limit to the bridge deck length? I didn't see it. Uh, there technically is not one. Um, you will eventually fall off the edge of the testing platform, um, and you only have 800 toothpicks. Right. So. I wouldn't recommend going any more than a toothpick or two each side, because all that's just dead weight. It's not buying you anything. Remember, efficiency is key here, so. Depends on your foundation. Well, yeah, well, you've got plenty of good, good wood foundation there. So a toothpick or two each side would be plenty, you know. If you make it too long, you're just going to be wasting toothpicks, weight, and glue, and lose your efficiency. Because ultimately, uh, the more efficient bridges or the lighter bridges that carry more weight are going to be the winners. So that little block has to fit out here in the middle of your bridge on the bridge deck. So the block is going to go through. You need to provide a hole in the bridge deck that that block can sit in the middle, in the very center, uh, thread down through the hole. So that thing is going to have to sit on the bridge thread down through it. So you got to leave enough room in your truss work that that block will fit down in there and carry the load. Material specifications, you got to use round uncoated toothpicks so those are provided. Elmer's glue. You can't paint or decorate the bridge other than that. It has to be the raw toothpicks. You can't coat the toothpicks in the glue or anything tricky like that. Uh, toothpicks may only be glued in the following way. So the idea is they can be glued end to end. So a minimal overlap. They should have no more than like a quarter inch overlap in here. You can glue them end to end. You can glue them, well, you can go through all these. But this one's showing <coughs> this way. You can glue them end to end with a quarter inch of overlap. Uh, you can glue end to side. So you can come into the side of another toothpick is fine. So you can see here, these are all coming together on the side of one toothpick. So about a quarter inch overlap coming together on the side of one. And then no side to side glue. That's an absolute violation that the judges will be looking for. Now you're saying, you're probably thinking, well, there's two toothpicks, right? But those two toothpicks, if you know, they're not glued together. Uh, so once again, you only get about a quarter inch to get the glue to hook that stuff up in those joints. So there's no glue here side to side on the toothpicks. You can double up toothpicks, but no side to side gluing. It can only be on their tips. So if you look, there's double toothpicks glued at the ends only. So that's a, a critical thing you need to pay attention to. And any bridge not meeting the material specification will be penalized. So the, the rubric is set up or the Judging points are set up, so pretty much if you violate the rules, Rory's going to say you lose, <laughs> kind of in a polite way, right? right. Meet, meet your clear span. <laughs> <laughs> meet the, meet the s material specifications, meet the, uh, the area, 12-inch by 2-inch area under the bridge, and use legal gluing, and you'll be all set. Uh, be sure to meet the dimension requirements of span. Not the length of the bridge, it's the span between <coughs> supports, the height, and the bridge deck. Uh, create triangulated structure, it's a stable form. So create, if you look every direction you look at your bridge, you should see triangles. So here's looking down the end of a bridge. All these triangles brace it from flopping over. I've seen lots of people build wonderful trusses that want to span over the opening. But the trusses are strong, but they just flop over once they load up. So here, all this cross bracing keeps them from wanting to flop over. So it's like if the wind is blowing on the bridge in real life, that doesn't want to flop over. And cross bracing helps take care of that. So all three space dimensions put cross bracing in there. And that's what happens at the end. You'll have lots of bridges broken up, smashed. This is from our COTC bridge. It's slightly different than the requirements for the work for the same test bridge, but similar. Any questions? So yes, there is no max length of the bridge? Not really, the no. Okay. Once you want to have plenty of bearing down here on your piers, so a pier maybe at least a toothpick long, if you want to double up, put two, two toothpicks worth of length out here, yeah, you, you'll have that, that allowed. The critical thing, once again, is nothing in here. Nothing can touch the table in there. You know, build up your two inches. 
fan across that. Anybody have any questions on that? That seems to be the trickiest part <laughs> of the whole bridge competition is comprehending that for that two inches right here, the bridge has to come up two inches and then nothing can touch in here. Anything touches in there, it's falling in the river and you, you lose. So that's critical. So they were pretty much limited just to crush bridge, thinking that okay, this doesn't lend itself to the arch or anything like that. Pretty much um, just crush. You can do an arch. I've seen two big yeah. arches. Yeah. But our our very first year, we had in, in Newark, uh, we had a girl that actually combined. Um, she had, if you looked at it, there were 19 different arch set shapes within her bridge, and it's one of the strongest bridges we've ever seen. So you can do an arch bridge. But, but a true arch, remember, your spring line here has to be two inches tall. You can't start arching from there or you'll violate the yeah, two I'm inch tall square. Mm -hmm. So you need to come up about two inches, then you can arch mm -hmm. or provide for that or start arching a little further out and make sure by the time the arch gets to this line, it's two inches tall. So that's the only challenge to, to a true uh, arch. But yeah, in my class, we get some wonderful and some experiments of them. Uh, the arch bridges do pretty well. The other trick to the arch bridge is make sure that you provide a flat surface, so you're kind of disadvantaging yourself. An arch comes to a point, and when that block is on there, it's putting all its force in that point. So you may want to provide a flat bearing area for the block. So make sure the block is sitting in a flat plane so that you know, it kind of equally loads up into the structure. Mm -hmm. So two things you'd need to think about uh, for an arch that's a little different. Any other questions? All right. Sounds like you all are ready to build two thick bridges.